Chapter 16. Reasons for Success Now let me try to summarize the reasons for my success for the benefit of those who will follow. By success, I mean the parts I played in developing great advertising enterprises, most of which continue. Advertising men are expected to do that. In advertising, we serve three interests, all of them allied but distinct. First comes the publisher, who pays us our commissions. He pays to the agency an average of 15% on the amount of the advertising. That is paid for expected service. The best service we can render lies in the development of new advertising opportunities. He expects us to increase the general volume of advertising by starting new projects or showing the way to profitably increase the old. Publishers learned that I served them well. I wrote, for instance, the first ad I ever read on automobiles. I did much of the pioneer work in that line, including the first ads on Chalmers, Hudson, and Overland. Publishers regarded me as a leader in that development. The first important tire advertising was the campaign which I evolved on no rim cut tires for Goodyear. Its amazing success proved to all tire makers that this line needed advertising. Toothpaste advertising was rather insignificant before Pepsodent came into the field. That quick success was one of the marvels of advertising, and now many millions are spent every year to foster dentrifices. No doubt the success of puffed wheat and puffed rice gave impetus to cereal advertising. The remarkable success of Palmolive created much soap advertising. My help in creating business for the magazines and newspapers led the publishers to help me. They have opened for me many fine opportunities just because they believed that my service in ad writing would increase their revenues. Another interest we serve as ad writers is the advertising agency. Many of the best accounts and agencies are the accounts developed from small beginnings there. Nearly all the accounts I handled were of that sort. Often much is at stake on these advertising possibilities. A mistake may ruin a fine prospect. Mediocre service may result in a small account where a big one might have been. That is why competent ad writers are paid such large incomes. In my case, I started with Lord & Thomas at $1,000 per week. But we soon agreed that the right plan was a commission basis. Then the agency paid me only for service which proved profitable to them. On the other hand, I received what I earned. Under that plan, I earned in commissions as high as $185,000 in a year, all earned at a typewriter, which I operated myself without a clerk or secretary, and much of it earned in the woods. In addition, I received a number of valuable interests, some of them without cost, in the enterprises I helped develop. My commission grew until it became one-third the whole agency commission. Mr. Lasker, during all my years with him, let me write my own contracts. He sometimes signed them without reading, for he believed me fair. But the natural result was that no accounts were turned over to me which other men could handle. Most of my accounts were developments from little test campaigns. But I was doing more than serve myself. I was doing my best to teach other copy men in the agency. I held many meetings with them to discuss the principles of copy. For that, I received no pay. Then I wrote numerous books to set down the agency principles. Because of those services, Mr. Lasker finally made me president of Lord & Thomas. Then, for certain reasons, chairman of the board. When he went to Washington to serve President Harding as chairman of the shipping board, I served for two more years as president of the agency. Those two years cost me considerable money. My commissions dropped because of my other duties. I received no salary as president, yet I spent much time with new clients. I presided at a meeting of our leading men every morning to help all our men who had problems. During those two years, I accepted no account for myself. By that I mean an account on which I obtained commissions. I wanted no one to say that I used my position to secure revenue for myself. As a result, my own revenue dropped severely. But Mr. Lasker always knew that his interests would come ahead of mine. He trusted me implicitly. At one time, to help compensate, he gave me a check for $10,000 for writing scientific advertising. 
That was one great factor in my career, the confidence I engendered. That was due to my Scotch ancestry. At one time, Mr. Lasker made me a trustee under his will. Again and again, I refused to accept from him more than I felt I earned. When my contract called for one-third the commission, I refused to accept it on accounts where I did not appear to be a vital factor. About the only disagreements I had with Mr. Lasker referred to his desire to overpay me. That attitude I consider a vital factor in success, an absolutely fair division. One on the crest of the wave may overplay his hand for a little time, but not for long. Business is money-making, and associates will find a way to eliminate anyone who claims too large a share. The third element in advertising is the advertiser himself. I put him third because he seems to come third in my conception of advertising. We cannot serve the publisher or the advertising agent without serving him. But the publisher pays our commissions. The advertising agent selects and employs us. The advertiser who is a beginner makes a slight speculation on us. Old advertisers who change from one agency to another are not very valuable clients. They have failed in their ambitions. In a large percentage of cases, the reason for failure cannot be corrected, so they usually switch again. The advertisers I value most are not those who come with the large appropriations. I could list scores of such advertisers who have no prospect of attaining their desires. Each succeeding agent loses reputation and prestige when he attempts the impossible. The most valuable clients are those who come to us with new opportunities in advertising. They are many. But the opportunity consists of a test campaign costing under $5,000. The agency commission on such a campaign is $750. The cost of developing a test campaign rarely runs under $20,000 if a competent man is employed. The men in charge may spend weeks in reading and in research. The stake in such cases is largely with the agency. The advertiser usually gets his money back, whatever the outcome. The real stake is made by the agency. Failure means that the advertiser loses a trifle the agency loses much. Success may mean millions to the advertiser. To the agency, it means 15% commission on the advertising, just so long as he holds the advertiser's goodwill and approval. So I feel no obligation to an advertiser who permits me to make a test. Mine is the speculation. That is why I place advertisers last in this category. But on the success of the advertiser depends everything else. We owe obligation to the publishers who pay us our commissions. We owe obligation to the agency, which gives us our chance. Our least obligation is to the advertiser, yet everything depends on his attitude. Success in advertising depends on these three elements. Three interests must be satisfied, and all of them are crying for profits. The only way to please all of them is to profitably develop what you undertake. I have devoted myself to the advertiser. Through his success must come my success with the others. I forget the rest. The advertiser who fails in a large way becomes forever a denouncer of advertising. I know that failure is inevitable in a large percentage of cases, so I never involve the adventurer to any large extent before we are sure of a profit. If he fails, the fault lies in the product or conditions, not the advertising. His loss is little or nothing. If he succeeds, his winnings may run into millions. How have I been able to win from this situation so many great successes? Simply because I made so many mistakes in a small way and learned something from each. I made no mistake twice. Every once in a while, I developed some great advertising principle. That endured. That method cost me, beginning as I did in the infancy of advertising, an enormous amount of time more time than other men are apt to devote to this primitive experience, much more time, much more sacrifice than I would want a son of mine to devote. That is the purpose of this autobiography, to help other men to start where I ended. Mr. A.D. Lasker, who is a very wise man, often attributed much of my success to living among simple people. He always wanted me to work in the woods where I write this history, and I have done so for two decades. Here, most of the people I talk with are my gardeners, their families, and the village folk nearby. I learn what they buy and their reasons for buying. 
Those reasons would surprise many who gain their impressions from golf club associates. The reason is rarely economy. We hear people of large incomes boast of their economies. They are not humiliated by them. But where economy is a necessity, most people like to defy it. When silk shirts cost $15, they became so common among laboring men that other classes went to broadcloth. Every shop girl demands silk stockings. My experience on cosmetics proves that a low price on perfumes, etc., does not appeal to the girl who should economize. She demands what the best people use. Many people around me working at small wages consider cost far less than I do. A woman who does our washing and who arrives in her own car has a fad for antiques. She picks up many pieces of value, pieces we are glad to buy from her when she becomes involved. The proudest people I know are the people who work on my country place. Suggest a thing to them because it is economical and you arouse opposition. You hurt their pride. But direct your appeal to those who do not consider cost and they like to be included. That is a single example of the things we learn by contact from the people who form 95% of our customers. America is a land of equality. Every campaign that I devise or write is aimed at some individual member of this vast majority. I do not consult managers and boards of directors. Their viewpoint is nearly always distorted. I submit them to the simple folks around me who typify America. They are our customers. Their reactions are the only ones that count. There is another field ably occupied. It is typified by the advertising of Cadillac cars. People of small incomes can well be excluded, but those are not the great advertising fields. I have confined my appeals to the common people, to the products which they buy.